recording. I think it's recording, I hope. Um, okay, cool. So um, I just wanted to take a moment um, to recognize Bob Morris. Um, Bob Morris uh, was a member of the Audubon Corps um, uh, maintenance group, Corps members since the beginning. He, he's, you could call him sort of the father of Audubon Corps. He was the lead author of the original standard and Audubon Corps probably would have never happened if it weren't for him. He was in declining health for the last year or so. So he, you know, he technically he was still on the um, the maintenance group, but he really wasn't able to participate due to his health. And he passed away uh, about a I don't know several weeks ago. So I just wanted to recognize him and his contributions to um, Tadwig in general, and also to Audubon Corps in particular. So. Um, the, so basically, the, the only thing on our agenda is just to basically to talk about our experience with these uh, test image sets and, um, you know, how we feel um, using the controlled vocabulary terms that we have so far would work with them. And so I thought I would just go ahead and start first by sharing what I did. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so so I basically used uh, two different data sets, and the first one was this plant data set, and the um, the controlled vocabulary works really great for it for a couple of reasons. One, so so you can see here's all of the images, and I was able to apply subject part and subject orientation to all of the images. There are a few questions that I had about coverage and whether there needs to be finer grained uh, parts and or uh, mostly finer grained subject parts. And that is something that we can discuss. But I have to confess that one of the reasons why this worked so well is that this is kind of a, I guess you might call an artificial data set. Um, this is actually a data set of images that I put together for a paper that we wrote on standardizing images of live plants. So if you look at these, everything is like oriented perfectly. Every lateral view is exactly a lateral view and everything is oriented in exactly the right direction. And every picture of the whole organism has the whole organism in it. And every picture of the inflorescence has the whole inflorescence in it. So if you have people who are taking pictures of live organisms with the intention of making them be somewhat standardized, then applying these standardized views is not really that hard. Now, if you go to the actual just sort of random images in the wild, which is what we see with the fish data set, then things get way more complicated because first of all, we have these images that are from publications that are not separated out into, um, th the individual organism images are not separated. And this is a point of question, like in the larger Audubon core maintenance group, we're looking at some things like how IIIF designates using fragment selectors, how we might designate parts of particular images. So I think if one were able, if we were able to implement that, then we'd have the possibility of, of providing like a, a, a pixel range for a rectangular box on the image. And then we could say that the view applies to that as opposed to the entire image. We don't have that, but that's certainly possible uh, for these sort of composite images. This is the kind of image that like is really troubling. You know, you have a whole bunch of fish and they're oriented in different ways. Here you have, uh, again, a composite image, but here we have parts of the inside of the fish. We don't have standard views for that. Here we have an image that doesn't even have, well, I don't know if this is a single speed. I guess these are juveniles and adults. So we have different life stages. Steve, Here's one that's fairly straightforward. Sorry. Nice. Steve, Fair, uh, yeah. where, are you supposed to be sharing your screen for us oh. to see the images that you're seeing? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry, I, yeah, okay. I guess I kind of need to start over, don't I? 
I don't know how many times I've done this. I was trying to follow with the uh, images in the folders. Yeah. Yeah. No, my bad. I, I, I do I this could, all the time. Yeah. yeah. I very carefully had this arranged on my screen where you could see everything. So, so I, what I was doing was just basically flipping through the plant nice. images and showing how like, you know, this is a, a frontal view of a flower and it's exactly a face on view because I intended that when I took the picture. Um, and, and that's true basically with all the images in the set. Whereas for these fish images, here's one that's like pretty close to a lateral view. Here's one that's a lateral view, but it's tipped sideways. Here's one that's sort of halfway lateral, halfway dorsal. Here's a fairly straightforward lateral one, but then you have these ones like this where there are multiple actually or, or separate organisms on the same image that are not separated out. So each individual part of this image could probably be designated as having a view, but not the, not the image as a whole. And, he, and here's a really problematic one where we have a whole bunch of fish in various orientations. So not only do we have the problem of not being able to specify a particular fish, but also um, not uh, having a number of different orientations. So, I, and here we have parts of fishes that are not in our control <laughs> vocabulary, like uh, innards and things like that. So I, I guess my take home from this is that in cases where you have um, like, uh, specimens in a collection that are imaged where people are very intentionally um, imaging them according to particular orientations or in the case of something like plants that don't move around where you can um, you can orient the plant in exactly the way the way the way you want before you click the shutter it it becomes a reasonably easy task to assign these parts and orientations. Whereas on something like fish where they're swimming around and you just have to click the shutter whenever you can, it's a, it's a, lot, um, a lot more difficult task. And I, you know, if you look at, I, I very quickly gave up on trying to apply subject part and subject orientations to those fish pictures because they were just too complicated. Whereas on the plant ones, I, I didn't have any trouble applying the orientations to all of those. So that's basically what I learned from my experimentation. And, and I put a few notes about this in the, um, in the notes here. And that could be a subject for discussion uh, as we get further on. Um, I am gonna enable screen sharing. And, and I'm just wondering, like Jennifer, would you, like to talk a little bit about what you uh, discovered? Are you good with that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I essentially just emailed Renee Martin. She's one of Leo Smith's students and she studies like uh, deep sea fishes. And she said that for her subjects and because she does mostly uh, work in collections or with fishes that have, have been extracted, um, the standard for that is just left side and lateral view because these are fishes that are compressed. And this is like, all the views are going to see, to see, to be like that. And that's what we have in this uh, fish folder essentially. Uh, let me share here. So essentially all her fishes, all her images look like this. It's just a lateral view of the fish and all of them are pointing to the left. And, uh, but she gave me also these other resources where they have like standard views of uh, other kinds of fishes that are not like this. So for example, these are dorsal view, lateral view of uh, dorsal ventrally compressed fishes and then right view and left view of this. I don't remember the name of these things, but uh, yeah, so like not the regular standard looking to the left, but these are also from specimens 
in collections that you can position and you can just set up as as you like as as Steve was saying with the things that are standardized but then in nature it's more difficult and I completely agree that trying to uh, make sense of positionings like this is not as easier but yeah that's kind of like the standard for fish is just one view side uh, left side and that's it and, and do you know how um, widespread the left side is followed? Does everybody do that? Or is that just followed by some people and other people do it randomly? According to what she said, that's the standard okay. left side. And for many insects, that also applies because the way we mount little things is glued from the right side so that the left side is all uncovered. Okay, that's good to know. And and this is a great uh, reference that we can um, that we can use. Yeah, um, so I left the file here in the folder, but also the link in the notes to the original source where what that she gave me, which is a, in a PDF on ResearchGate. Great. And, and then, yeah, go ahead. When I uh, did the exercise with the beetles, it was not difficult, as you were saying, like you intentionally place the insect or the specimen in a certain way because you want to show this particular character. So uh, most of it was pretty straightforward, like dorsal views, lateral views, frontal views. And I uh, was able to do this easy. But then there were some instances like this where you have like an oblique view because you want to show coloration of the legs, for example, in this case, or uh, there was another one. These heads where mm -hmm. you have like this oblique view that is not dorsal, is not lateral, <laughs> is not uh, frontal itself, but it's like a compromise where you can see uh, certain features. So to this one, I was not able to find uh, like one of the standards that with. So I think, you know, one of the things that we that we have in the um, sort of umbrella Audubon Corps maintenance group, one of the issues that we've been talking about is um, what is like, what is a best practices guide? And we, after aspiring to make best practices guide, we decided that actually what people really want is examples of what people are using that works. Mm -hmm. So we've really moved away from saying, this is how everybody should do it, rather saying, this is how people have been doing it that works. And I think that sort of approach, you know, like because we hope that these views are extensible, then I think what we will can do is if, if we discover, for example, that it's a common practice to take a view that's, um, I don't know what you would call it, anterior dorsal lateral. <laughs> You yeah. know, looking at the head from that particular angle, if people do that a lot on insects, then we just add that as a view. I mean, it doesn't make sense to add every possible view because unless you ag aggregate more than one image that has that view, there's no point in it. But if that mm -hmm. is a commonly followed practice, then we just document that and, and add it to the views. Okay. Yeah, and the other little issue that I came um, was that I'm not entirely sure if these are dorsal views or ventral views of the wings, because essentially you see it the same way either in either orientation. And then for the antenna here is that once that once they are detached from the specimen and flat in a uh, 
slide. microscope slide, you cannot, like it's difficult to. Yeah. To and understand if it is that parts that when you just look at that part, it's view is not so meaningful. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good, it's a way to put it. So but the, the view nevertheless is important because if you look at the band at the, the first uh, antennal segment, like in ants, that's important the way you look at that because that's a, a character. Yeah. So you yeah. say it's a lateral view in the sense that you, you expose the full uh, curvature. So I think one of the things that is sort of coming up here is the, um, the need for having a term that's where it's not specified either. We don't know, we can't tell, or we don't know or something. And, and in the existing um, terms, there is a, I think it's a, I think I used unspecified or something. Okay. So I guess one question is like, what is unspecified? Do we need to distinguish between this is unspecified because nobody looked at it, or this is unspecified because we couldn't tell? I mean, I guess you could, I guess it may be better to just have missing data if it's unspecified mm -hmm. because we don't know, and to actually apply that controlled value term if, if it's impossible for us to say because there's not enough information or. Or if it doesn't fit one of the existing doesn't categories. Fit, yeah. And then people would know like, okay, this image is there, it's an image of an antenna, but don't expect to be able to line it up with other antenna images that are in a more standardized orientation. Did I forget to put antenna in the parts list? That would be a shame of me. No, it is there. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> the antenna here. It okay. is, but the orientation is what I wouldn't, I mm -hmm. wasn't yeah. able to. Yeah. So I think, I, I guess sort of, uh, oh, well, Donna, do you want to talk about ants, your ant pictures, and then we can just move on to sort of general discussion? Yeah, okay. So let me share my screen then. Uh, When I did not code these things, I should should have done, so I didn't look at the vocabulary. But I added all the, the views for these ants and also for precious types, so you can look at them. So essentially, it's like Jennifer's. It's, it's a lateral view, and it's left side. It's a label, normally given. It's in this case, which is a bit more extended, that's why I took it too. It's a, a ventral view of a head. It's a full frontal view of a head, which is always like a standard. It's again, it's a ventral view of an early trunk and a petiole, which is not very common, but I just added it here. And it's a dorsal view. So you have a dorsal view, a full, full frontal view, and, and the lateral view, which is our, which are the standards. I have a question. Are this yeah. when when you have the full head, is this frontal or dorsal? No, it should be full frontal. So essentially, you try also to make orthophoto. So you, you try to expose the head. So you look at it in the right angle on, 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 on the head from... Yeah, I, from I'm asking to, because for the weevil that, I, one of the weevils that I showed, uh, the frontal view is focusing on the mandibles, like the mouth part insertion, and not necessarily, like I have dorsal views of the head where you can see uh, the head oriented in such a way that the entire thing is uh, parallel to the lens. But then in a frontal view, you would have like mandibles first and then all the way down. So I. Yeah, I mean, this is also a problem sometimes here because in this case, it's very obvious. You see the, the occiput, the, 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 the uh, upper part of the head, which is in, in focus. Mm -hmm. And you see the tip of the mandible, which is in focus. So you can, you can do it. In some cases, the mandible is very bent. So you don't see it, 
then you yeah. kind of try to to twist a bit. But I don't know. I mean, it's probably this is considered full frontal view. Okay. So it's definitely it's not always like ortho photo, but it's uh, the best. It's like a standard in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that that we can just keep in mind is that that uh, the new sort of view of Tadwig vocabulary standards is they're never done, and it, it, as opposed to this idea like we're going to get this perfect and then we'll you know create a frozen standard. So I feel like in this particular case we have something like uh, anterior view of a head, and and it, maybe it's not that specific. But then it, once we have a significant number of images that have been classified in that way, then if we discover that, that there is a need to have a more specific view because you know half of the head images are a certain way and half of them are another way, then we can just make a subcategory of that. And, and if somebody wanted to then sort through all the images, they wouldn't have to look at all the images. They could just look at the head images and then split them into those two categories. I mean, if, uh -huh. if we knew we needed the category now, we should make it now because we don't want people to have to do a second pass of going through all their images and recategorizing. But I feel like being, being worried, like we can't do this because we don't know all the final answers. I think we should, I think that we can move ahead and define the views that we can define now and refine them as we learn more. Yeah, but I would also like quickly to show the examples from Fabricio's types, which is one reason we started this discussion. So, but again, look at this. So here is a, a right side view. Is it big enough? Yes. Well, beautiful images of this 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 uh, types in in the Aachen collection from the the late eighteenth century. So this is a left side view, like a lateral view. This is a dorsal view, a ventral view. This is a dorsal view. So those are the images they they make for all the types. And you could say, if you go back to the end images and also those that uh, Jennifer showed, I mean, you can be, if, if you look at it from a point of view, you, you just explain from a more top down. So there's a ventral view, it's a dorsal view, and that uh, covers a lot of cases already. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if, for example, if you can have these this terms, to add these Fabricius things to, to say no or now, that's already helpful because there are thousands of these types and then there are 10,000s of, of ants which are like that and there are beetles like that. And, and a lot of like pinned insects are all of these categories. Yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. The one other thing that we usually would image for beetles is the genitalia, and then you would there have is, male yeah. and female. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. And then in the standard right now, we just have genitalia, mm -hmm. but we don't have male and female, for example. So that's another thing. Yeah. That I... So okay. I think yeah, as a subcategory. Right. I I think this is. I mean, it's a very similar thing with like flowers. There are, are in plants, some of them have dioecious male and female flowers, and some of them are hermaphrodites. And if they're dioecious, then you want to be able to say which kind you have. So I think, you know, one of the questions that I had is like, what does it mean in SCAS to say that you have like a, a, a parent? I don't remember what the term is, a broader, a broader category. And I think. SCOS is like very loose about that. So you could say um, that a broader ca category could be, so like you could have male and female genitalia, each of which have a broader category of genitalia. But you could also have it be a more specific part. So like you could have, an, I don't know, antenna and then a particular segment of the antenna. So, so the, the 
uh, way that you're subdividing the categories is not, it's not strict like it would be in an ontology or something where you say that like a, a child thing has to be a constituent part. It could be a constituent category as well. And I, I think that's freeing because I think it means we can break these broader categories down into narrower categories in any way that we need to in order for this to work. I, I think that people aren't gonna, people wouldn't be as picky about that as they would be if we were defining like a formal ontology. Mm -hmm. We're just basically saying like, you know, if you could just say genitalia, but you can also break it down finer if you want. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good approach, yeah. So I feel what, what I would like to sort of do at this point, now that we have, you know, kind of run these tests is to say, does this, the way we have it set up, essentially work? I, I, there are obviously cases where it doesn't work as well, like the, the live fish, for example, but there are a ton of use cases like the pin like the specimen, the photograph specimens or carefully uh, photographed live plants and things like that, where it actually does work quite well. And we don't, we don't have to solve every use case. We just have to solve the ones that people care about. And so what we actually, we make a differentiation on between wildlife photography and, and this scientific photography in the sense that these, which are, based on protocols. And I think essentially that's what you say. So for all this, which comes out of digitization of IDIC bio and DISCO and all this, these are all like standard views and standards we use in a very wide thing. And it's probably well worth to, to focus on those images and not on wildlife photography. Yeah, although I, I, I being a person whose primary concern is <laughs> photographing live plants, I would say I don't see any reason not to do that in cases where we're able. So, for example, I mean, for oh, no, no, it's, it doesn't mean yeah. it doesn't mean we should not do it. Yeah, I mean, we should address it. It's more right now. I personally, I'd be happy if we can have have a few terms to actually cover like eighty percent of the right images we we produce right now by machines mainly. So I feel like um, there's. So between where we are now and moving this into a standard, we would have to get, you know, get approval. Well, we would have to go to public comment and, and to get the uh, executive to approve it and so on. But I, I don't feel like there is a problem given that we have um, designated namespaces for these. And, you know, I've given up on the idea that like local identifiers should mean anything. These are just, these are just sequential numbers. And there, I don't see any reason why we should change what we have now, because if, if we try to make them systematic, like having all of a certain kind of, uh, you know, view in a, some certain sequence, then that's just going to break in the future when, when we add more, because we will be adding more. So in that sense, I think unless there's something wrong with the ones that we've already defined, I don't see any reason why uh, we couldn't just say, go ahead and start you. <laughs> I mean, we maybe should talk a little bit about uh, uh, how to um, specify them. Like for instance, I, I feel like specifying the full URI is probably the safest thing just because I mean, you could do a brief, the namespace abbreviation colon thing, but I, I think, you know, what's a couple more bytes in a string? And so anyway, I, I feel like we could, you know, if you wanted to go ahead and use these designators that we have already and start putting them in Zenodo, um, the fact that they're not a standard yet, I, I don't think should be a problem necessary, particularly if we try not to change what we have right now between now and when it would become a standard. And I think one of the things that's really irritated me in the whole Tadwig standard process 
is this idea of developing standards before you know that they work. And <laughs> the, the real standards problem uh, process that W3C and IETF and stuff do is they, they define use cases and then people build applications and see if they work. And then that's when they turn it into a standard. And I feel like that's sort of what we're doing now where we're hammering out, this is how we think we could work. You got, you have a bunch of images that you can use this for, then start using it. And that would make it even the more compelling case when we get to the ratification process to say, this isn't a pipe dream. We're already using this and we know that it works. So I, I feel like it, you know, if you guys agree with that, that we should just move forward and try to flesh out the uh, vocabularies as we have them now for the groups that people have ex cared enough to participate in, which would be ants, beetles, live plants, and fish. And if that's all that we do right now, then that's what the standard oh, will it's be. Entire I, mean, I, I, I think it's so. already covered for butterflies if we cover beetles, because they're even simpler. Yeah, so I guess that would be the question. It, it, I mean, I, in my past work on this, I gave up with the idea of that, that we should have some sort of strict taxonomic boundaries yeah. between sets of images, because like realistically, any kind of herbaceous angiosperm, um, whether it's Fabaceae or not, is going to have the same views, whereas you might have some other Fabaceae that's a tree and it's going to have bark. So like yeah. the, the, the breakdown is really not about taxonomy. It's about what no. groups can share yeah. the same views. And so that might be an exercise for us to think about at this point, which is what, especially in insects, what taxonomic groups share characteristics enough that we could lump them in a particular set of views. So for but instance- You see the, the case we have here with Fabricius is essentially a good thing in that because it covers all insects. So we have the, the, the image, the entire collection. So we have all the, the holotypes or the, the, the types at that time of, of Fabricius. And that's, it's an interesting experience. Look at what, what we get, where we strand. So we start with these beetles and, and, and ants, and then we'll, we'll see. Yeah, so I guess the question would be, if we, if we define, um, I mean, is there going to be something different about views of beetles and views about ants? In other words, do e either of the, those, do those groups have specific structures that we would need, that people would care about photographing that would differentiate them? I mean, I'm thinking about like flies have halteres, they don't have But they're have not photographed wings. generally. Right. Yeah, but you see, so, this is, but this is the point that and also Jennifer said before, you can always go into more details. You can yep. always add things, but I personally think we should rather go and say, okay, we use like the most common views and start on that. And then we can add more to it. So, so that means I, we could do, we could, that, in, in say, no other case, we could upload all these, this, um, so you know this, this Fabricio things, and we have like a basic taggings, like dorsal, lateral, frontal, or ventral. Yeah. So we can already show what it means because you then can write an, uh, an application, say, show me all lateral views. So I mm -hmm. think the, that what we can aspire to at this point is stability in the actual um, organism part and organism view identifiers. The collections, how we group them, we would not necessarily say are stable at this point, but that doesn't really matter because we can figure out what collections of, of views we need with, um, with experience. So maybe right now we could just say insects, maybe that's good enough. Uh, no, but you have for, you for the same, for the specimen, you have all the metadata, which explains you what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's, for me, the Ottoman core is just this, uh, this um, custom metadata, which is about the view. Yeah. And all the rest is in different things. So you start in core for other things, and we have the, the, the mods and then other things for the library data. So what sort of form 
I mean, I can turn these things into JSON that you could give to your, uh, you know, application programmers, and they could read that in, and and you know, it would connect the strings like dorsal with the URIs that we're assigning to them, and then they could uh, do, you know, like string matching or whatever if they want to do. Is that would that be the next step? Then what would you want to make to move forward on this? Um, well, we need the terms so that we can we can uh, create custom metadata to say like Audubon and, and, and just a couple of examples, how you want to see it and how we have to cite it. Yeah, so I guess one question that we haven't really dealt with is um, that the existing terms are not clear about whether they take literals or whether they take URIs. For, for many of the other Audubon core terms, they're, they're in pairs. So you have, uh, um, I've been blanking on the names of terms, but you see them throughout Audubon core, blah, 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 and blah, 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 literal. But for subject view and subject orientation, we don't have that. So maybe what we need to do is to fast track um, this in the regular maintenance group to add. To, so what I would propose is that subject part and subject orientation in following the pattern with other terms would be used with a URI. Then we would have subject part literal and subject orientation literal, which would allow people to use the controlled value strings that we define. Um, and, and, and I think that that would follow the design pattern that we have with other terms and, and we could fast track that pretty fast. So what that would mean for you, Donna, would be that when we define these URIs, your, your vocab, Audubon core vocabulary term that you'd use would be subject part and its value is gonna be a subject part vo controlled vocabulary URI. And subject orientation is the term, property term, and then the, URI from the subject orientation controlled vocabulary would be the value. And that would, and for people who use spreadsheets and freak out about use URIs, they could use the controlled value string. But, um, you know, I, I personally think URIs are better just because this issue of capitalization and people doing snake case instead of camel case and all that crap. You see the, what, 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 well, you have to talk to Marcus about these things, the technical, but the way we do that, like, can you see this, this example? Is it big yeah. enough? Okay. So what we intend to do is to use custom, custom keywords, is custom metadata. You see, there is a term host of, and it refers to this uh, OPO term. So we want to say like lateral view, and refer to the Audubon core, and then we can spe specify the term. Yeah, well, so the host of is the term, and then you, they and then it has values, right? So what yeah. we would be get your term instead of host of would be Audubon core uh, subject part, and then your values would be URIs from these lists of URIs that we're collecting. Exactly, and then there's another one which is subject orientation, which is important. Right, so and that, so that we have that term already and the, that would be the uh, property that you're showing there. And then the values would be the URIs from the subject orientation uh, controlled vocabulary that we've created. So I think oh. we're, I mean, like we're there basically. <laughs> So, I think it's, how does it look? Uh, maybe. See, the same assumption like here's in JSON. Yeah. So, I don't Can know. Can you send me the, or just put the link to that in the chat? Um, I'm, not, I'm curious to know whether this is, do you know if it's actually JSON LD or if it's just, pro, it's probably just vanilla JSON. Oh, this is, this is, hold on. This is JSON LD. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that's good. 
Yeah, JSON LD. Okay, great. Because then, you but know, it's then not we're... In huh? Sorry, go ahead. I think JSON LD is not as comprehensive as JSON yet, but that's some you. But if they're using JSON LD, then that means their structure is compatible with, with what we're talking about here. They're yeah, going to have sure property and values, so so that should all be good. So if you can if you can write sort of a feature request, sort of I mean write this together with each just talk, then we can submit this to our colleagues at Zenodo, and they can implement this as custom metadata. That'd be cool. Okay, great. And then we have to find a student who goes through all the, or see how we can actually automate the linking or tagging all the images with these terms. I mean, if they already have um, somewhere in the metadata have things like dorsal and ventral, whatever, then there's there's probably some string matching. Yeah, probably somewhere. That could yeah. no, at I least think partially sure. automate sure. the process. Hi, Rich. Good morning. Hi, Rich. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I was actually up. I was just being interviewed by the Guardian. So, oh, uh, cool. And so now I'm jumping from meeting to meeting. I just got your email. I, 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 I know I missed the whole show, but you suggested I should maybe join because it involves live fishes, which always gets me excited. So, yeah. So, and, and I just wanted to mention I'm recording this because one of our participants can't be here. So, uh, I, Hopefully you're okay with that. Oh, absolutely. In fact, send me the link because I'd like to see what I missed. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So we basically we've gone, we, we have a number of image sets that uh, various ones of us have put together and we sort of tried to apply the controlled vocabulary terms that we have so far. And we've learned some things like uh, fish are hard because they move around and there's a bunch of them in the same uh, picture and stuff like that. But for at least museum specimens, the, the approach that we're taking seems pretty good. And to the extent that we're able to use it with live organisms, fine, but we're not going to freak out about if it's hard. So um, that's kind of what we've been talking about. And the last thing, so Donuts got, um, I mean, they have a bunch of, uh, of uh, what do you call them, holotypes that are in Zenodo or being put into Zenodo and, and they're, they're ready basically to be tagged with um, these controlled vocabulary terms. And I guess we're kind of assessing whether things are stable enough that they could go ahead and do that uh, as sort of like a test case. And, and I'm, I think we're concluding that we could, right? It's just a matter of working out the logistics of that. So that's kind of where we're at. So can you can you uh, since you are the expert here, can you write up like in a very minimal terms what we should ask in order to do? Yes. And maybe use the the Fabricius types are there and add the subject parts and all the right terms. So we can use that and then and I'll talk to or maybe you have to talk together at some point with Marcus who does all the import and to Alex who does all the, the Zenodo side. So what, what I'll do is take a look at that JSON LD that you put in the chat and try to figure out how to specify how that relates to the terms. I don't know if they'll have to have a, a context. Probably they have to add something to their context file to include the Audubon core namespace. Um, yeah, you have to tell them and then include yeah. it. But once they do that, then I think it should be straightforward to, to, you know, to describe how you would map those properties and values to their JSON LD schema that they have. And then and once 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 you have the Audubon core accepted, then it, it seems to be very. I mean, then it, then should there be another problem from that point? Yeah, and so what we can do is provisionally define like this is the namespace that we're planning to use, and these are the terms that we the the controlled vocabulary terms that we have defined so far and we think are usable, and then uh, like I said, I can make those available in JSON for you know if somebody wants to make a tool or something or or, or write a script to automatically match 
uh, labels with the URIs or something like that. I, I, I have uh, the ability to make that available. So let's do, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, with what we have here, we have some pretty major groups like insects and plants <laughs> and fish. And, you know, if people see this working, then other people will come on board and they'll help us develop the subject parts for other groups when they care enough to participate. Like between insects and plants, that's most of macroscopic life. Yeah, uh, the important parts. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is like for a lot of ver vertebrate specimens are not generally that co complicated, right? You're gonna have maybe a dorsal view and a lateral view and maybe a close-up of the front of the face or something. And so the, the, the views that we've defined, even though we've really only been talking about fish, they're not gonna be that different for amphibians or mammals or anything else. So I think they could be co-opted for those purposes. So I wasn't part of most of this meeting and most of the Audible Encore discussions, but has it been discussed that Morph Bank had worked a lot of this stuff out, especially for fish, like, you know, different views and things like that, or is that kind of going to the wind? Well, so I'm aware of that. So one of the things for, for the benefit of the other meeting participants, the, the examples that I gave for plants are actually directly from a Morph Bank page. So I was involved with um, submitting live plant images to Morph Bank and the problem with the Morph Bank system was that anybody could define their own views. And a view consisted of like 10 different characteristics. So by the time a person defined a view with all the possible characteristics, your image, your one image that you applied it to would be the only one in the database that had that view. And so it really was, so part of my effort was an attempt to standardize this and say like if you plants, orientations and so that data that photo set that I used here was actually one that I used in Morph Bank and there's a um, there's a, so Bruce Kirchhoff and I wrote a paper on standardized views for live plants and it revolved around that. So Steve I, I think your microphone got bumped or something because you suddenly got really quiet. Well, I don't know what to do. Luckily, we're almost at the end of our time. But, but anyway, that history from Morph Bank is a part of this. And what we're doing. Still can't, I still can't hear you really, at least. Okay. There was kind of a loud noise and then it went quiet almost like your jack got bumped or something like that yeah so can you hear me now i can barely hear you if i turn my volume up to max i switched to uh my okay let me try a different microphone can you hear this better yeah much better. I, I have like three different microphones hooked up so i just switched to a different one um so um yeah, so anyway, what I was saying is that the, the whole Morph Bank history is, and Greg Riccardi was on the Audubon core team when these two terms were adopted. So we're, we're really just doing a very stripped down version of, of what Morph Bank did because it was way too complicated. But that history is uh, sort of incorporated in, in what is driving our work here. <clears throat> Regarding morph morph bank or this thing is, there is a, a move to move or at least part of that into Zenodo now. So maybe we come up again to, in the near future, talking about this terminology. Yeah. Because it doesn't exist anymore and it's not supported. And, and, and so some people, they added a lot of energy into it. They want to get it out. So like, and yeah, we'll try well, to help them. If we can, you know, if we can develop mappings between what we have here and, I mean, there is a, there are components of the Morph Bank views that correspond to what we're talking about here. 
And it may be that with a metadata export from MorphBank, we could directly map those views to the, the views that we have here. That would totally be doable. So we're almost out of time and I have another meeting to go to right after this. Um, is this, uh, so we are in a month from now, we're gonna be at the changeover time between summertime and wintertime. And that, as I've already discovered, varies depending on whether you're in Europe or North America. And also, I don't know, does Hawaii even go to daylight time? So there's gonna be some shifting, but is this time approximately okay for a month from now at this day and time? Yes, for me it works. Probably. And is it bordering on late for, what time is it there for you? It's um, right now it is just about to be six in the afternoon. So that's where if it goes later because of time zone shifts and I can never remember which way it goes, that will be a problem. Yeah, well, what I can do is, the problem is that if, uh, let's see, what is it, spring forward. So it'll go later when we go to summertime, but if Rich is already on standard time, then, <laughs> yeah. I'm always minus 10. Yeah. So I never change and I can start at an hour earlier. Uh, okay. 5 a.m. is usually when I start my day. So. Well, let me I do think this. Moving the Grinch mean time past two, so. so. What, what did you say? And then we move into GMT plus two, from one to plus two. So yeah. it's going to be seven o'clock here or so. So what I can do is if this, if this day of the week is okay, I can go to the time zone planner and try to plan the time such that it doesn't go, doesn't start past five. That's when you started, right? That would mm -hmm. keep it out of like dinner time. It's not optimal, but it would keep it from being closer to the middle of the night if Rich wants to participate. Don't and, don't worry about me because yeah. A, I'm used to dealing with weird times, you know, and B, I, I guess I'm not even sure what this group is relative to the other Audubon core group that we just this, chatted. This is, spoke, this is focused entirely on subject parts and subject orientation controlled vocabularies. That's okay. it. Well, and, I will join when I can, but I certainly yeah. wouldn't schedule it around Hawaii time zones. So. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll just keep you up to date. And I mean, what we, what I would like to do from this point forward would be to take what we have developed and try applying it within people's databases um, and, and see how it works. Um, and I have like 15,000 live plant images that I could apply it to in my bioimages website. So let's try it out. And then I think we could be within a few months of being able to, um, to move this towards ratification. But I think at this point, what we wanna do is test it out more. So I'll, I'll suggest a time that roughly corresponds to a Wednesday a month from now, no later than five o'clock at whatever the prevailing Central European time zone is, standard or summer on that day. And then I'll uh, just send out an email. Well, thanks everybody. I'm super excited. I feel like I feel like we could be done with this task by the next Hadwig meeting, and that would be really awesome. Okay, You're so share okay, send, send send the send this so kind of feature request, and now I'll yeah. um, get it done on the and, and I side. will uh, save. I'll upload the recording to YouTube and send the link to. Um, well, I'll just send the link to the names that I have on the list. Um, which, and I'll add you to that, uh, Rich. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye everyone. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.